Welcome to Teacher Tom Hanoi. This is a mock IELTS listening exam. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. I repeat, all the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Good luck. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man called Tim and a woman called Laura discussing preparations for their holiday. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now, listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Our plane tickets arrived this morning. It reminded me how much there is to do before we go. Let's write everything down, shall we, so we don't forget anything? Yes. And last time we went away, we almost forgot to collect our currency from the bank. So let's start with that. Good thinking. And wasn't there an appointment you said you'd got to cancel? Yes, the hairdresser. Thanks for reminding me. Can you write that down too? The shop will be closed now, but I'll do it first thing on Monday. OK. Then starting on Tuesday, we've got to take the tablets we got from the pharmacy. We really mustn't forget to do that. We're not protected against malaria till we've been taking them for at least seven days. No, so that's really important. And what about shopping? There's still a few things we've got to buy the next time we're in town. We need some more sunblock, don't we? We've only got that Factor 10 stuff. It won't be strong enough. I've already bought that. But what we do still need to get is sunglasses. The ones I've got aren't good enough, and I don't think yours are either. OK, I've noted that down. And I think I'm going to get another bag too, just a small one. We always seem to come back with more things than we take. <laughs> Shall we get an extra lock for our suitcase as well, just in case the one we've got breaks? They don't seem to last long. Yes, they are a bit flimsy. OK, right. Oh, yes, and we need an adapter for our electrical things, your hair dryer and my shaver. The plugs on them are bound to be the wrong type. We could get one at the airport. They always have them there. Well, I'd rather get it beforehand, so... I'm writing it down. Then I think that's it, isn't it? I think so, as far as shopping's concerned. But we also need to order a taxi to take us to the airport. We should do that well in advance. My sister left it too late and she had to take the train with that huge suitcase of hers. I know, she really struggled with it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, let's see. Your mother said she'd come in regularly while we're away. So what do we want her to do? I'll write some instructions and we can give them to her tomorrow. Good idea. Well, the cat's the main thing. OK. Feed the cat. We ought to leave her the vet's details as well, just in case there's a problem. Yes. Have you got them handy? Hang on. I'm just looking. Yes. His name's Colin Jeffrey. Is that spelt with a G? Actually, it's J E double F E R E Y. Quite an unusual spelling, isn't it? Hmm. And his number? 
0777-594-128. It's a mobile. OK. And you should write down where it is. It's 4th Street. Not sure what number, but it's next to the bus stop, isn't it? It's not a very good landmark, but it's on the other side of the road to the church, so I'll tell her that. Uh, let's hope she won't need it anyway. <laughs> yes. Right, apart from that, there are the plants to water. Ask her to make sure they don't dry out. Oh, yes, and I've already mentioned the problem with the boiler, and your mum said she'd come round to meet the heating engineer and let him in. Yes, it's a lot for her to do, but we really need to get the problem sorted out. And the earliest date I could get an appointment was April the 30th. Isn't it the day after we go? Yes, we leave on the 29th, and she'll have to hang around till the job's finished. Oh, well, she won't mind, I'm sure. She likes helping people out. Yes, she does. OK. That's it then, I think. Unless you can think of anything else. Not at the moment. Leave the list there and I'll add to it. That is the end of part one. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to part one. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk on the local radio about a short film festival in the town of Adborn. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Today we're pleased to have on the show Fatima Johnson, who is the organiser of the Adborn Film Festival. Welcome, Fatima. Hello. Can you tell us a bit about the background to the festival and what it brings to the town? Well, the festival was started in 1996, by the then mayor of Adborn, Joanne Smith. She wasn't a filmmaker herself. She'd actually been a very energetic tourism development officer for many years. But Adborn had run a classical music festival, which had been becoming less and less popular in recent years. Joanne was looking around for something to replace it and to use funds allocated to it to promote something which local people can enjoy. <laughs> Great. So, tell us about the festival nowadays. Well, it's held in the last two weeks of August every year, and short films from all over the world are shown in three places, uh, in the theatre and our two cinemas. Several films are shown in one performance, and the whole thing lasts about 90 minutes. Tickets are very reasonably priced. Under 12s used to get in for 50p, but now we charge just £1, which is still very good value. £1.50 for students and £2.50 for everyone else. Performances are advertised all round town and also on our website, www.adbornfest.com. If you're interested in attending any performance, you can buy tickets online, of course. And you can also get them in the library, which is right next to the main shopping area. I'm afraid this year tickets are no longer available from either of the two cinemas, 
because of restricted opening times. Oh, I understand you also run a film competition? Yes, for under-18s. We have a different theme every year. Last year, for example, the theme was Future Planet, and the winner was a ten-minute documentary encouraging youngsters to be more aware of environmental issues, focusing on getting school kids to cycle to school instead of going by car. This year, the theme is Sporting Nation, so there'll also be lots of ideas to choose from. Now, we're always on the lookout for new local talent, so if you live in the Adbourne area and are under 18, you should have a go. We have an excellent prize every year donated by local businesses, shops, hotels, etc. This year, you can win a high-spec movie camera worth over £800. Application forms are on the website, and the deadline for sending in your film to enter the competition is the last day of July. It's May now, so you'll have the whole of June to be working on it. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. And what are the judges looking for? Well, although we choose very topical issues like the environment, we're not looking for propaganda, you know, trying to get people to do something. <laughs> Instead, we're looking for a new angle, a fresh way of looking at a theme. And of course, because it's a short film festival, it's not really about a fully worked story with well-rounded characters. It's more about good photography, conveying things visually. Mm. And who judges the films? A panel of three people who know a lot about film. We've used the same judges for many years and we're very happy with their expertise. One thing we probably will change next year, though, is we want to add another class and another prize for older filmmakers. We'll keep it at a maximum of ten minutes, though. The length works well for our festival. We also want to use different venues for the film shows, such as community centres and at least one school. It might make performances more accessible to a wider audience. We did explore the possibility of having late-night showings, but that's unlikely to happen in the coming year. So, as I say, if anyone's interested in submitting a film for our competition, go on to our website and you'll be able to access everything... That is the end of Part 2. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion between a male interviewer and a woman who is the manager of a major bookstore. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. The start of a new academic year is a challenge for booksellers. Lee Rogers talks to one major bookstore manager. 
Jenny Farrow, you're the manager of Dalton Books, and you sell an awful lot of books to students, don't you? Yes, we do. How do you manage to make sure that you're going to have the books students need when all the new courses begin? Basically, we make preparations long before they arrive. Like all other major book retailers, we have a database of information, and using that, we contact course conveners in May and ask them to send us their book lists. How many books are we talking about? For one course? Yes, as an example. An average course requires about thirty books. We ask lecturers to indicate whether a book is what we call essential reading, get it, or whether it's what they would term recommended reading, or whether it's just a supplementary text that they tend to refer to as background reading. What about predicted buyers? It's not a perfect system, unfortunately. If a lecturer tells us that he expects us to sell a hundred copies of a book, we know that we could actually sell anything from fifty to a hundred and fifty. That's why, in practice, when it comes to ordering, it's a lot safer to go by the previous year's sales figures, if that's possible, of course. If we've sold the book before, we also build other factors into the equation, including the type of course that the books are for. The students' year group and a measure of our own judgment. And these criteria make a fairly accurate guide. As accurate as we can be, yes. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now, listen carefully and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. What about the publishers? Do they take an active role in promoting new books? Certainly, the academic and professional publishing market is worth about seven hundred million pounds a year. So publishers go to some lengths to make sure their books are known. The standard procedure they use is to mail out catalogues to lecturers or colleges and universities. That's been the main form of promotion for years. Now, of course, they can also post details of new or revised works on websites. Some even go so far as writing individual letters to the appropriate lecturers in order to let them know what's coming up. The lecturers then contact you if they're interested. That's right. The publishers send us, the booksellers, inspection copies. Lecturers can then get a free copy and decide whether it's going to be suitable for their course. And how does it work? And who helps them most? I think lecturers are best placed to understand the students' needs. Often, the critical issue is what represents value for money for students. This is more important than price per se. Do students actually buy books before they start the course? Apparently, a large proportion of students wait to see what they need. Students have a firm idea of what constitutes a good book, so they tend to give themselves time to look at all the options before making a choice. They tend to go for books that are clear and easy to use. Often, the texts that their lecturers recommend turn out to be too academic and remain here on our shelves. Well, that was Jenny Farrow, and I guess tomorrow. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to review your answers to part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator, giving advice on how to get your first job or commission as an artist. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors and the driving force is there. However, when you leave college you find yourself saying things like, I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work. <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem, it's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people. But artists also have to bear their souls to the world, in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble drawing pictures for books, cards, and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations, which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book but without having had any work published, it's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or a collection of original artwork is of course a first step, but what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork, and without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offer. Now, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. I overcame this problem in two ways. <clears throat> and I, I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition. And the one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine. There are a few of these competitions each year, and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. <laughs> Perhaps I was lucky in that I, I had taken a degree that provided me with all-round creative skills so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. Now, I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields 
do try to pigeon this with an accompanying label. Now, I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't, you'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case, I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. It's then easier to analyse the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. For artists to be recognised in anything other than the pigeonholes that they've been placed in, but luckily these barriers are slowly being demolished. So I really do... That is the end of Part 4. You now have 30 seconds to review your answers to Part 4. That is the end of the mock IELTS listening exam. You now have 10 minutes to review and transfer your answers from the exam paper to the answer sheet provided. Thank you for your attention. Let us know in the comments what score you got. Also, please like and subscribe for more mock IELTS exams. Thank you, and see you in the next video.